Welcome to our webinar, Embracing the Owner Mentality, with Joan Burge and her very special guest, Darren Martin, Ph.D. Darren is author of A Company of Owners as well as Whiteboard, and we are very excited to have Darren as our guest today because he has a lot to share with you, and Darren is one of our featured speakers at the administrative conference we're hosting this October, The Revolutionary Assistant. Welcome, everyone, as you log into today's webinar and say your hellos there in the chat box. It's wonderful to see you and so much activity. Hello, hello. Nancy, Sherry, Cheryl Ann, Andrea, it's so hard to keep up with, <laughs> with all of you as you say hello, but we love to see it, so keep those coming. And uh, before I turn the program over to Joan and Darren today, I have a few logistics to review with you. So Joan and Darren will be speaking for about 40 minutes, followed by a question and answer later in the program. So you can submit your questions throughout the webinar, just mark them as question in the chat, and we will flag those or watch for those and uh, facilitate those questions later on. And just keep in mind that we do have a lot of you online today, hundreds already so far and probably um, closer to thousands once we get really rolling. So keep in mind they may not be able to answer everyone's question, but they sure will try. Uh, we do not have a handout today. There is no handout. So just rest easy, take lots of notes um, of all the great points you're going to hear today from Joan and Darren. And uh, uh, just repeating that, no handout today. Okay, now I would like to introduce Joan Burge, founder and CEO of Office Dynamics International. Joan Burge is an accomplished author, professional speaker, consultant, and corporate trainer. In 1990, Joan created a business in an untapped niche overcoming monumental obstacles involving managers' attitudes, prejudices, and stereotypes about executive and administrative assistance. Office Dynamics International is a global industry leader providing high-performance, sophisticated executive and administrative training and coaching. Joan's never-ending quest to provide top-notch educational programs to assistants and their executives has earned her the respect of premier clients like Cisco, AT&T, Humana Inc., Sunoco, Procter & Gamble, and Nationwide Insurance, to name a few. Welcome, Joan. Hi, Jasmine. Yay, it's Webinar Wednesday. I'm so excited. And as always, I love watching all the names come in and to see uh, all the different places that everyone's coming from. I'm sure Darren's going to be very excited, too. We had 3,400 people register for today's webinar, so I believe this is a topic that everyone is intrigued by. Uh, we are very excited to have Darren Martin with us today. We purposely chose Darren as one of our premier speakers for our 23rd Annual Conference for Administrative Excellence, which is being held this October in Las Vegas, because our theme is the Revolutionary Assistant. And we like Darren's revolutionary ideas and philosophies about changing workplace cultures. Let me tell you just a little bit about Darren before we say hello. Darren is the author of A Company of Owners, a book that's taking the corporate world by storm, transforming how organizations operate and how employees think. It's, by the way, it's an awesome book. You can see I've already flagged several pages. I've read the whole thing, and we're already applying his philosophies at our organization. With a PhD in psychology and impressive background leading corporate change initiatives, Darren has a unique and inspiring message every administrative professional will benefit from hearing. So welcome, Darren. Hey, Joan. I am, and, and all the rest of you, I am so excited about this. I've really been looking forward to this time. Good. Well, we're excited to, to have you. And I don't know, have you ever had such a great audience, almost three, 400 people on a webinar? Absolutely As far not. as the webinar goes? No, this is fantastic. <laughs> this is definitely a first, so I am stoked. Good, good. And well, after after Joan hearing your uh, intro, I'm just wondering, why am I even talking? <laughs> 
Why am I even on here? We, we, should, we should just hear from you, but uh, very impressive, obviously. Thank you, thank you. Well, this is going to be great, and um, for our audience, I do have specific questions from Darren, but we're also going to keep it casual and formal and probably go back and forth a little bit, and be sure to put your questions in the chat box. As you think of them, we'll be sure to get to them later on. So the first question, Darren, I have for you, of course, is can you start you know, telling our attendees about your approach and um, this new philosophy that you're teaching and how it ties into being revolutionary? Okay, so the book, actually, A Company of Owners, started with a conversation with the CEO of a $20 billion company. This was probably four or five years ago. And I told him in the hallway, you need to fire your employees. Now, before everybody starts hanging up, okay, just hear, <laughs> hear me out on this. People are going, wait a minute, you're telling people to fire us. Um, and that was not my point. He said, you know, Martin, what are you talking about? And I said, listen, you don't want employees. You want people who act like owners. And one of the things I'm excited about with this audience, I bet if we were to um, do a survey with them, that because of their role and because of the positions they're in, that there is an inordinate amount of owners within the admin rank. But we're going to talk about, you know, how that can get even better today. But the reality is uh, your typical U.S. company, well, let me ask you, what do you think the engagement level is at your typical U.S. company? I'm talking about people who show up, act like it's their company, ready to rock and roll. What do you think the average engagement is according to Gallup poll? Are you asking me or our audience? Uh, well, I, I, I'm asking both, so people can, all right. so, can, re um, can respond. I'm not asking you, Joan, because you read the book. You're going to know, know exactly what the so answer is. I would but, have an advantage. That wouldn't be fair. <laughs> all right, so people, and I, I can't see the chat, by the way, but people might be chiming in. But uh, okay. I, I get we'll ga guesses kind of all over the board. The reality is it's 29%. 29% engagement at your typical U.S. company, which means that most companies are operating effectively with a third of their workforce. And I just, I think that's abysmal, and I think we can change that. Well, we had a few people close. We had Lisa had 26%. Uh, Sandra had 20%. Wow. Uh, that's I have the results of our poll, and it looks like 43% of our audience Pick the 26 to 50 percent range. Wow. Okay, so you ran that poll. So that's wow. that's that's. I started to say awesome, but it's really not awesome. It's kind of sad, right? That mm -hmm. that's the engagement level. And this, I, you know, I I talk in the book about uh, two kinds of employees. There are basically two out there. There are the Stacys, uh, and the Stacys are super engaged, involved really on top of their game, they're bringing new ideas, they're bringing new energy to the company. And then there are the crawlies, okay? The crawlies are what I call zombie employees. Uh, maybe it's ironic that I made the state, the, the, the woman, the engaged one, and the man, not the engaged one. <laughs> Who knows for your audience? I think they will love that. But um, yeah, so crawlies are zombie employees. They're just kind of going through the motions. And We've got a lot of crawlies in companies across uh, across the board. Uh, I call it the corporate zombie apocalypse, which if you just walk around the, the hallway of a typical company, you find a lot of people that are just acting like drones. And I don't think I don't think that's good for them. I don't think that's good for the company. And I think it drags us down overall just as a as a society. So let's change that. Mm -hmm. So your concept truly is revolutionary in terms of, you know, historically for years and decades, um, the mentality of, of companies is that we have employees, you know, who work for us. But Absolutely. I know just I've seen it in my own company now as I've been shifting more to that owner and making each employee feel, even though I have a small group, but feeling like they are really participating, they are an owner and their decisions mm -hmm. do matter yeah. um, and their contributions make a difference. They're acting differently, I'm getting better results, the company is doing better, we're able to give better service to everyone. So it, it definitely is a whole shift and how are you going to get these people to change their thinking? I'm curious. I, Joan, I love it. I love what you're doing and what you're describing because that is the company of the future. And I say in the end of the book of, hey, if you don't believe this and you don't want to adopt this, fine. 
be prepared to be extinct because we are seeing a big movement towards what you've just described. Um, not to get all fancy, but a couple of big words, if I can throw these out, uh, <laughs> that they're, they're important. But a meritocracy is when you have a company or a society where you get promoted based on your merits, what you do. I'm all for that. You perform, then you get you know advancement. There's a new one, a new word. It's probably not a new word, but it's uh, new to the corporate you know, language. It's called a holacracy. Do you know what a holacracy is, Joan? I'm putting you on the spot here. Do you know what? I'm very proud to say I just found out in January because we toured Zappos oh, you know, in Las awesome. Vegas. Yeah, Prior to that, exactly. I did not know. I was like, what is this? Okay, so <laughs> but I'm sure most of our audience doesn't know. No, and I, I didn't know until, and I toured Zappos actually about a year ago. Zappos just announced, what, six months ago or so, that they are completely doing away with management, with supervisors, with any of that. You're going to have your job. That's your position. They expect you to own it. Now, that's way out there for most of the companies that are even chiming in and listening in today. That's, a, that's, you know, that's probably way down the road potentially. But it's interesting that a company like Zappos is saying, hey, we're going to hire the right people, we're going to hire A performers, and then we're going to treat them like A performers. You know, I say in the book, if you want people to act like owners, you've got to treat them like owners. And part of the reason we have such low engagement rate is uh, people aren't being given you know, the, the runway or the leeway to actually perform and act like owners. So they just end up checking out at some point. I think you just said something. It's not on our little script here, but it really struck me when you said people aren't being given the leeway. And I know this is going to build into what we want to talk about, but uh, something I know I'm always talking to assistants is, a, is to take the initiative. Don't wait to be given permission to act that way, to have the authority, to, to be empowered, um, because they may never get it, right? So. Um, I was thinking my kind of leads into my next question, my perspective, I was feeling like this owner mentality could truly be a secret weapon for an assistant to go from being an order taker and task doer to being an indispensable contributor. So uh, I love it. Do you want to be fireproof? I mean, absolutely indispensable to any company. Listen to what Joan was just talking about. And Joan, obviously, people, I think most people listening may know your background, but you've proven this with your own life. You came up through the ranks. You, as, you know, established yourself. And I know you did that by doing exactly what you're talking about. You did not wait for somebody to tell you what to do. You looked around, found out what needed to be done, and went and did it. Um, so for, and I hope everybody listening right now is going to be at the conference because we're going to have a great time in Vegas. Uh, but I'm going to give you a little tip. It's a little heads up. I'm hoping everybody forgets between now and then. But one of the things I do when I'm with a live audience is I, I will stand at the front of the room and I'll say, and I'll do just this, hold it up and go, who wants a you know, free copy of my book? Who wants a free copy of my book? What do you think the entire audience does at that moment? It's raise a good book, Joan. They're raise, interested. Their they, hands. they raise their hands. I want, it, I want I it. want it. I want it. I want it. And then I'll tempt them some more. You know, who wants a who wants a free copy? Who wants a free copy? And I'll do that. Who gets the book? The person who leaves their seat and actually runs toward the stage and puts their hand out. And then I now we're gonna have 500 people rush the stage if I do okay. this at, in Vegas now. There they go. They're already. <laughs> they're, 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 okay, they're remember already, that. They're if you're running, to the conference. They're, run up. They're, they're running for the stage already. But yes. So when I do that, and then I make the point. Listen, owners go to the ball. They don't wait for the ball to come to them. They go to where the action is. In fact, uh, Wayne Gretzky, you know the old uh, you know, hockey player. What one of the most successful all-time hockey players said, he attributes his success that he doesn't go to where the puck is, he skates to where the puck is going to be. He's anticipating and running ahead of that. And I think that is the single biggest thing that, the, the, that everybody listening to this can do is don't wait for the need, anticipate the need. Can, can I show you something real cool? Sure. Okay, you'll be the judge of that, but hold on, hold on. I got I to gotta get up. Hold on. Okay. 
Okay, I'm back. So I'm staying at the West and outside of D.C. Can you all see this? Uh, hold it up one more. Let's see. Pack lights, stay fit. Okay. All right. So here's what it says. Call Service Express to experience Weston gear uh, lending. Get new balance clothing and shoes delivered to your room to use during your stay for only $5. Wow. Uh, it's their Weston workout. So if I forgot workout clothes, now the only I'm going to tell you what is very upsetting about this for me because I have no excuse now for not working out. <laughs> I, can't, I can't say I don't have the shoes. Exactly. I don't have the right clothes. But this is anticipating. This is them looking around as a company. And a little shout out to the Weston. I'm, I'm not even a, a regular Weston, uh, uh, I, I uh, you know, stayer. But that's huge because they are anticipating a need and fixing it before you even knew that you had it. That's what owners do. Very good. That's a great example. Thank you for sharing that. Um, when we spoke on the phone, you said something I really liked. You said, owners are learners. You participate and you show up. So can you speak to that for our um, administrative group? So what's the old, you know, 95% is showing up, uh, the quote's been attributed to a number of different people. I was at a conference and was getting ready to speak to an audience. I got on the elevator and people were talking about the conference and going to the conference. And one of them said, I've been in the business for 20 years, you know, I hate coming to stuff because there's never anything new to learn. And I thought, oh my goodness, wow, you are stuck. Because I think the most successful people are people who wake up every day as a sponge to learn something new, uh, whether it's reading a book, readers or leaders, uh, you know, listening to podcasts. I think something that's huge. Okay, so congratulations, everybody that's tuned in right now. Give yourself a big pat on the back, okay? Give yourself a big round Yay. of applause. Why? Because you showed up for this. You could have been doing a lot of other things, but you said, you know what? I'm excited about this. I, I may learn something. Just by nature, the fact that you tuned into this broadcast means that you fit into that category. You're a learner. People that attend the conference, Joan, you know the difference between people who would show up at that, like what we're going to be doing in October and people who would never show up. Mm -hmm. And generally, it's a separator. That's the cream of the crop. Those are the folks that say, mm -hmm. I'm going to go find out something new. I've been doing what I've been doing for a long time. I have a PhD. I probably spent upwards of five, six thousand dollars last year, maybe more, going to things for me to learn. And I'm the mm -hmm. trainer, buying books, getting new information. Uh, and in my experience, people that are really willing to kind of develop themselves, they separate themselves from the pack very quickly. Mm -hmm. They really do, and I know um, what's interesting, what happens in our industry or arena is, one, it takes a very long time, and it's uh, an uphill road to get an organization to invest in in-depth training for their assistance. So it could take two years. I mean, one, one company, one big bank we've been working with, it's been two years that they've been working on getting approval for me to come on site and teach our, our very lengthy flagship program called the Star Achievement Series. So it's a massive program. There's two levels of learning, eight full day workshops. So it does take longer you know, to get in. But what's interesting when we finally do get on site, you have this group that is so eager mm. to come and they're chomping at the bits and yeah. they can't wait. Oh my gosh, they can't yeah. get enough of it. And then there's a group who who don't take advantage and I feel like yeah. that's so sad because it's such a big deal to be able to get that training you know within the organization and like you said I think that's what separates what I call the star performing or star achieving assistant from the ordinary you know absolutely um, and they're probably showing up to the training the same way they show up to life and the same way they show up mm -hmm. to work every day and it's sad to me because mm -hmm. Wow. First of all, we're living in one of the richest, most wonderful countries in the world, right? Yeah. Uh, we have jobs. Everybody that's listening to this is, is, is probably employed. Um, and we have so much opportunity. And to see that squandered away, P 
people have you ever heard this you say to somebody how are you doing and their response is no complaints now think about that <laughs> think about that as a metrics for how my day is going well yeah. I have no complaints so I'm starting to say to people if someone says no complaints I, I, I want to say back to them oh well we should come up with some because there's got to be something you could be complaining about but you know how different is that from going through life in a way that I am outstanding I am fantastic mm -hmm. because the way we talk to ourselves the way we talk about ourselves really does influence how we show up mm -hmm. and you know I don't I don't know if you know this but it's it's actually a proven fact every single person in the world makes other people happy every person so it's, it's a you know scientific proof some people make people happy when they walk in the room and some people when they walk out of the room out. right okay <laughs> so what kind of person are you what kind of person are you being and that difference between when you show up to a training or you show up to something like that and you are full on and ready to give it your best I guarantee you that's gonna happen at the conference because they're not gonna have any choice we're gonna we're gonna force them to right Joan exactly it's, it's gonna be exactly. it's gonna it's gonna be game on <laughs> but uh, yeah I, I people are just bored and they are uh, bored with life. They're bored with work, and it it it's not supposed to be that way. It can be so much better. Okay, great. Well, I'm watching the chat while we're talking to kind of looking back and forth here. So um, it looks like we have a request to get to some specifics. Um, Somebody out there is hungry for a little more meat from us, and so I think, well, what if we wanted to do first of all is set the framework, which is very important. And um, I would say that this really is not like anything you have probably heard if you're really listening in to what Darren is saying. So because this is this is very new and, and definitely a trend where companies are moving and so what I always say to people is being an owner is owning what you're hearing and to say how can I take this and apply it and I also like to do a rating scale what I always do um, and we could do this with the character I want you to share the eight characteristics what I always say to people um, whenever we're going through a list of characteristics or attributes, and I do this with myself, it's to ask yourself what percentage of time do you portray that? So I'm sure everyone at different times have an ownership mentality or take the initiative. But what I would say within a year's time, are you doing that 20% of the time? Are you doing it 80% of the time? Are you doing it 75% of the time? So the idea is to up your percentage. None of us will ever be 100% of everything all the time. It's not humanly possible. Right. So Darren is going to share with us uh, from his book, he lists eight fundamental characteristics of owners. So he's going to go into detail at our conference with these, but I really wanted him to kind of go through the eight today and what I would like you to do as you hear these characteristics rate yourself on that scale over a year's time what percentage of time do you display those characteristics take notes and then you'll know wow here are the areas I really shine in and wow here are the areas I need to excel and grow and um, Darren, I know what was helpful for me when I went through your eight characteristics. I looked for specific action that you listed. Um, so that way I knew, like when you talk about initiator, you know, you actually said they don't, you know, wait for the ball. They grab it and advance it down the field. So could you include? action with each, with each one so they could say hmm you know what percentage of time do I do that over a year love it love it so analyzer is the first one how many times do you produce data or information or you're requested to uh, you know put some facts together some things together you compile it and you basically just hand it over um, certainly I know people who work for example in accounting departments that have 
very important numbers coming across their desk every day, but they don't really ever stop to think, what does that number mean? Why is that number big, this number small? So people who are owners don't just give data. They analyze and look at what it actually means and how it impacts the business, um, including not just the first deal, but what's the second uh, potential order impact or third potential order impact. Um, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. They removed uh, or they put up uh, the, the cameras at intersections in a certain city in Texas, small town. They put them up to, to keep people from running red lights because they wanted them to be safe. And so, you know, if we ticket them, then maybe they'll stop. But they, they pulled those lights or those cameras out two or three months later because what they weren't anticipating is the accident rate actually went up. Oh, people wow. were heading to the intersection and they would see that camera and the light would turn yellow and they would slam on the brakes and somebody wow. would run into them in the back, right? So it's not just at first glance, the kind of information you're producing that you're putting together. It's not just, hey, here's what this means on the surface, but what may it mean on a deeper level? So providing more in-depth uh, analysis, here's the data, but here's some you know, extrapolations from that. Uh, right. Initiators we've talked about. Certainly, um, I, I want to give you another one in that category. Come with a plan, not an idea. There was a, uh, a oil and gas company, a very large oil and gas company, been a client of mine for 10 years, and there was a super entry-level position uh, for the person, uh, for the, for this particular person. I mean, basically what their job was, was to go around, make sure the coffee was stocked, bring the mail from department to department. Anybody would look at that job and say they have very little influence, okay? Uh, this person happened to be really big on being green and looked at the amount of styrofoam cups mm -hmm. that the company was using and all of that and didn't just gripe about it, didn't just say, uh, you know, we need to make a change, we should be green as a company, but actually put a program together, got the cost involved, mm -hmm. got the vendors lined up, and didn't come with the proposal until they were ready to say, hey, this is what we've been doing so far, here's how much it cost, Here's what we can do instead. This is why it's going to be an advantage to the company. And this lowest level position within the company was able to take a oil and gas company, you know, keep, keep that in mind, green. Well, that's initiation. That's really coming with a plan, not an idea. Most people just throw out ideas. Hey, it would be cool if, or I really think we need to do this in, in this area of our business. But they never actually do the research to come up mm -hmm. with something. You do that. You do that alone. When you... When you bring, to use a sports metaphor, but if you were to start with the ball on the 10-yard line with 90 yards to go, that's where most people's ideas are. When you bring it and it's already on the 10-yard line, hey, boss, uh, manager, I was noticing that we have this issue. I've dug into it a little bit. I've been watching it over a period of a couple of months, and I think uh, we should do this. In fact, I've already done the research on it, and here's how we could do this differently. Boy, that's invaluable. I guarantee you, you'll win some sort of award for that if it's a if it's a significant change. Uh, strategic thinker would line up with that as well. It's not just uh, people who are coming up with ideas, but they're being very strategic about the business. What office, you know, what mm. what company or manager or you know boss is not looking for their company to make more money, to be uh, to have a bigger footprint? And when you can think strategically and notice things, because I'm sorry, but the people that are listening to this probably know a lot more about the company than sometimes even the CEO does. Is that true? Yeah. yeah. Because, in fact, I, I walked into a law firm one time, big, big law firm in Dallas, and the guy said, well, what are you going to you know, do for our company? And I said, well, I'm going to tell you things about your company you don't know. I said, well, how are you going to do that? I said, well, I'm going to start by spending some time talking to the receptionist to check me in because I guarantee, you know, she knows, yeah, what she the, knows what the real lay of the land is here. And in my experience, most companies have hidden cultures or they have the, the stated culture, which you see on the wall, and then they have the hidden culture. And mm -hmm. admins probably know that hidden culture better than anybody. So thinking strategically about, hey, here's what we say we do. Here's how I think we could align better with that from what I've experienced. Or here's an area where I feel like we're not performing at our peak. 
And I think to use that kind of language, to be very positive with suggestions that you're putting out there, not, we're not even doing that. We say we do this, but we don't do that. You know, mm -hmm. I think, I think getting out of that negativity is huge. Showing it as a path forward, uh, forward thinkers, it is 2016. It's 2016. Many companies are operating like it's 2006. Okay. Or like worse yet, it's 1990. I told a company recently they were getting ready to do something. I said, great. We're now finally entering the 20th century. And people looked at me like, wait, you mean 21st, right? Like, no, <laughs> no, no. I mean 20th. Um, we've got, all sorts of opportunities and ways to do things differently using technology and you know most companies are so far behind the time so being a forward thinker where are we going as a company how do we leverage technology in a way that really helps us be more successful connector is a very specific one find somebody in the company that you've not spent any time with and go to lunch with them I don't care what level they're there they are if it might be a VP of something it might be um, you know, uh, uh, an intern that's only been with the company, you know, 30 days, find somebody in a department or a group that you know very little about, go with them and then just ask them, hey, you know, how would you see the company through uh, your eyes? What do you mm -hmm. think we do well? What do you think we could do better? Compile some of that information, bring that back. That could be tremendous research. Um, learner, we've talked about, boy, being accountable when, when we're together in October, I'm going to talk about the three kinds of responsible. Joan, do you know the three kinds of responsible? When we think of teenagers, we typically think of the first kind of responsible, which is irresponsible. Okay. Wait, teenagers get a bad rap. Teenagers get a bad rap. I'm sorry, teenagers, because there are some very responsible teenagers out there. Uh, and, uh, you know, irresponsible is I don't do what I say I'm going to do when I say I'm going to do it. Responsible is I do what I say I'm going to do when I say I'm going to do it. But there's a third kind. Anybody out there want to chime in? I can't see it, but you might. Third kind. Let's see. All right, audience. Come on. I know you could think of something out there. A They're third stumped. Kind of responsible. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to I, them. All right. Non-responsible. Oh, non Non-responsible is any time I attribute something outside my, inside my world as being outside my control. Mm. So, Joan, I said I would get that to you by Friday at 3, but, you know, I was waiting on something from uh, Jim, and I never heard back from him. And I even emailed him, but I just get back. I'm so sorry. I just wasn't able to get that to you. But it wasn't really me. It was Jim, right? Mm -hmm. Non-responsibility is all over the workplace. And we're going to talk about how that cannot be you because if you want to be a standout, become a 100% of the time responsible person. That doesn't mean you can always control all the circumstances, but it means that you own it regardless and that there's never a woulda, shoulda, coulda. And, you know, I know um, that everybody listening to this, there's a lot of moving parts and, you know, some people might even be agitated with that. Just bear it out. Mm -hmm. we we'll talk about it in October. It'll, it'll uh, be more clear, but learn to be responsible in everything, in your relationships, in your work, uh, be responsible. And the last one's empowered. Uh, it goes back to what you said earlier, which is don't wait, make a decision, lead the pack. I have found very few uh, managers or bosses or, you know, people that are, um, you know, running companies who get upset by someone showing initiative. Mm -hmm. um, most people sit back and wait. Hey, I haven't been told, so I don't know. I, you have as much power as you decide that you have. And when you decide that, hey, I, this is my company. I can, I can do what I need to do to help move it forward. Now, don't, don't, um, don't think in terms of don't don't mistake uh, an inability to do it in an appropriate manner with oh no see I'm not really empowered. Do it in an appropriate manner in a way that can be received, but yeah, be empowered. So that's just a quick hit. Well, those are awesome. I've been making notes, some notes as uh, you were talking, not to not to be rude at all, but to circle back on a couple of these and thinking of our audience and the assistants specifically. 
Um, first of all, though, let me run through those again. I noticed some people were wondering what number three was and number seven. So um, for the audience, I'm going to go through the list again. These are the eight fundamental characteristics. Analyzer, initiator, strategic thinker, forward thinker. Am I in line with the book? Yeah. Okay, I'm putting awesome. Them up, I'm putting them up so here. We have a little visual effect with this. Uh, Absolutely. Connector. Um, learner. Thank you. Perfect. Accountable, which I love. And number eight, drum roll, brrr, empowered. Awesome. <laughs> hey, good, for good teamwork. <laughs> nice, nicely done. So uh, the few that I wanted to comment on, the analyzer that, you know, that really struck me when you talked about not just getting information together, but analyzing it and, and what does it mean. And so I've been working with a very um, uh, interesting CEO here in Las Vegas the past couple years, and he has a, you know, a huge company worth millions and millions, and I've been personally coaching him and his assistant. And I'll never forget one of the sessions that I, when I was over there and he and I were sitting together and he's showing me all these numbers and he said, see, she brings me all these numbers, but what do they mean? Love Don't it. just throw me all these numbers. I expect her to, and it wasn't that she could come up with some analysis because I know there's times when, as the assistant, I, I don't know what these mean, but in this particular situation, she could have looked at those numbers and said, well, Ron, you know, here's how I interpret this, and so this means this. Um, can can I, I say know, can, yeah, go can ahead. I say something on that, Joan? I had an office manager one time. I was running my own business. We were struggling financially, and uh, this was years ago, and she would come to me, I would be in between meetings, and she would come up to me and say, Darren, we need to pay some bills, okay? Mm -hmm. At which point, my blood pressure would just shoot up, you know, <laughs> what does that mean? What does that mean? Are we going out of, you know, what's happening here? And so finally, I went to her at some point and said, listen, please, don't ever do that to me again. I want you to come with me, I want you to come to me with a complete list, I want you to have thought through and prioritize them. Hey, we may want to pay the light bill, you know, first because mm -hmm. we're we're about to have that shut off. Prioritize them, show the bank account, you know, balance and how they impact, and hand me that so that I can go through and check off, you know, with your recommendation. Hey, I recommend here's where we are. I recommend that we pay these five things now. These can wait till next week. That's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and so many people just don't. Don't get that. I, I had an assistant one time um, for a brief period of time, but who I was looking to book a trip. Now, I live in Dallas, Texas. I was looking to book a trip to Tulsa. So she went online and she got five different options, sent them as five different PDFs. So mm -hmm. I would have to click on each one and open it, but I couldn't just see a running, like, you know, here's what the options oh, are. Oh, right. Yeah. She just kind of screenshotted it. One of the options to fly from Dallas to Tulsa was for fourteen hundred dollars. Okay, now I don't know Gosh. if people know their ge geography, <laughs> but I could drive it in four hours. Oh and I, wow! I, this is what I'm talking about. Not thinking, I'm thinking, why would you even include that in the option? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to bill my client fourteen hundred. I would be fired if I turned mm -hmm. in a fourteen hundred dollar plane ticket. Um, but it's that lack of anticipation that I think people, when we turn our brains off and do that stuff, mm -hmm. instead of doing the the analytical work of what would I want? How can this, you know, be best received? Sorry, I just had to jump no, in there. No, that's good. And and I another simple, you know, it's a simple example, but um, to me, I know as assistants are always wondering, you know, how can I apply this to my day to day work? So another example I was thinking of is uh, sometimes when I go in and do the coaching work, um, assistants will will keep logs, or even if I don't go in and do coaching work, sometimes I'll tell assistants to keep a log for three weeks 
of what you handle. So how many meetings are you handling? How many appointments do you schedule? How many trips do you schedule? And basically our goal or their goal is to negotiate their workload or to show their boss that they're not they're doing a lot of the nitty gritty work but they're not doing anything really big and challenging. Love and so it. to me that's a perfect example of saying, okay, I've collected all these numbers what do they mean? Right. <laughs> so you might end up saying, what it means, Mr. Executive, is I'm spending 80% of my time on nitty-gritty work, yet I'm this high-level assistant, and you're paying me X amount of money, but I'm only doing 10% or spending 10% of my time on really high-level work that makes a difference. Okay. That's what we're talking about, right? So let's, so let's frame this up this way, then. Okay. Mr. Executive, I want to apologize. I need to apologize to you. I have been running some numbers for the past month, and here's what I've discovered about where my what my job has evolved into. And I'm spending 80% of my time on low-level priority stuff. I know you. I know how driven you are, and I know how passionate you are about things. And I want to talk to you about a plan because I believe I can produce a much more high level stuff in these areas. And I want to talk to you about a plan for making that happen. So make it about something you're doing for them versus mm -hmm. I don't like, you know, all I do is schedule meetings. When, when you come at it from that angle, it looks very self-serving. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't care what relationship we're talking about. You got to make it about the other person and what value you're going to bring them. And then bing, 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 then they perk up and get interested. Mm -hmm. Very good. Excellent. That was um, well said, and I'm glad you gave our group or our audience the script, you know, because that's what they want to know. How do I say that? So yeah. I love that. And that also, I think, pulled in the strategic thinker piece, what you were just saying, right, because it's also showing you're being a little strategic about it. Mm. Yes or no? No, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, very few people... In, in my experience, very few people in the company are thinking strategically about the company. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of CYA going on. And hopefully, the, the person, the gal or the guy at the top is thinking strategically. But many times, they feel like they're carrying that whole load. And when you can come with some strategic thinking of your own, hey, I've been looking at this over the course of three months. I think we could sell way more online if we were to do X. Or I think we would have a great, uh, much more engaged workforce if we could make these two small changes. What do you say we try it for 30 days and see what kind of impact we get? Mm -hmm. uh, or here's a tremendous way to save us money that I've been looking at. That's strategic thinking. And as I said earlier, I can't think of a, a leader out there who wouldn't open that, you know, receive that with open arms after they yeah. probably picked themselves up off the floor. <laughs> <laughs> um. The uh, empowered piece, I made a note, um, because a common thing I hear when I'm out there in, in all these different companies um, is, well, but I'm too busy to take ownership. You know, I mean, let someone else start up the administrative lunch and learns uh, for monthly. So, um, so when we're thinking about empowering, I, I'm definitely on the same page with you that we have to really empower ourselves to take things on and to create change and to suggest new processes. On the other hand, what I hear often is, but I am so busy, I can hardly keep up with the day to day. So what yeah. do you say to that person who feels they're too busy to be empowered? Yeah, that's, if you're too busy, particularly on low level stuff, there's your first task or assignment okay being an owner doesn't mean that you do everything it means that you help everything get done so sometimes that's outsourcing it's finding a more appropriate source for that uh, it's setting up a recurring process where maybe that uh, you know you're reinventing the wheel every time you do that process years ago um, I had a uh, office manager that would spend three days doing payroll because she was figuring it all by hand mm -hmm. and she was too busy to learn Excel. QuickBooks was literally sitting on her desk for six months, but she was too busy not using it <laughs> to take the two or three <laughs> days to, to use it. Well, she ended up moving on and I was responsible for payroll, a little company I just started. 
And I went through those three days of doing payroll, but I guarantee that by the next month, I spent the extra 20 hours to implement QuickBooks and to do the things necessary. And from then on, it was an hour process, not a three-day process. So you've, you know, it's the old, I'm too busy cleaning the house to hire a, uh, a mm -hmm. maid, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a loop that people find them in, but that's, that's never going to get better until you decide, look, I'd rather spend a little time on the front end fixing this process and mm -hmm. getting this, you know, automated or getting this, you know, uh, uh, pushed off to somebody else that might be more appropriate instead of just continually doing it and staying in that hamster wheel. Okay, great. Well, I notice it's 1045 and I don't want to, I don't want to take up any more um, time. I could ask you many more questions. I have a list here, but this is really for our audience. So Jasmine, I'd like to turn it over to you for questions. Okay, excellent. Let's see here. Hopefully we have several. Oh, we have so many questions. We <laughs> even have a couple of nominations for Darren for president. So <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> I love it. Uh, yeah, really awesome. So let's see here. Um, Kamisha asks early on in the webinar, are the majority of disengaged employees, do they have a, is there a correlation to their tenure, Darren, in their career? I've seen people be disengaged for 20 years. Uh, this is part of the problem that we have within the company. And, you know, now I, and I think you're probably asking Tanisha from a different perspective, which is when you've been doing something for 20 years, 30 years, does it get kind of old and stale? And that's the challenge that we have in all of life, right? You're married 30 years, you're either reinventing that relationship every day and you're uh, coming up with something new. How long was, I, I know I'm not finishing my sentences here. I'm sorry. It's just part of the, part of the way I operate. How long was Steve Jobs at Apple? Did Steve Jobs get bored with Apple? No, because he was constantly coming up with new things. So I don't think engagement is a level of, is an impact of tenure. I think it's because people check out and then guess what? They become, more disengaged over time because they're not reinventing their job every day. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Gail asks, I'm going to speed through these questions so we can get to as much as we can. How do you manage when you as the executive assistant are taking on the ownership mentality but maybe management has been um, threatened by this type of ownership mentality because they've had EAs in the past who are more button pushers and they're not used to someone being a leader in that role. So how do you get management to change their mindset and trust you in that ownership? Make it about them. If you go saying, look, I've got this. Why do y'all let me handle this? I'm on it. That's very different from saying, hey, listen, I know you've had some issues with this in the past. I want to show you a different model, and I think I can bring some things to the table that will make your job so much easier. What if we try it for 10 days, and if you don't like it, we'll go back to the old way. So give them a test uh, trial period and give them why it's going to be good and advantageous for them, not this is who I need to be as a person. Don't come at it from that angle. Excellent. Thank you. And I saw Janella ask this question, which I believe she received some replies from her peers, but a lot, a lot of um, assistants on the webinar actually repeated this phrasing. And I, I think I know what the answer is, but I'm going to go ahead and ask it so they can all get, um, get your answer on this, Darren and, and Joan, if you'd like to chime in here. My company has restricted me in my growth. I'm an eager learner, and growth... Um, is something I desire in my career. I want to take ownership of my career and take a risk. Any advice on this? So, and then the others were saying they're not getting the funding, they're not getting the budget, and so on. Okay, wow. Um, growth is on us. I mentioned I, I am, I work for myself. When I go to something, I spend out of my own pocket. Now, I would much rather companies get not be short-sighted and really see the value of doing some things and training because it pays huge dividends. The kind of stuff that y'all are providing through Office Dynamics, that they'll pick up on that. But what you may try is read a book, do some things. It doesn't have to be super expensive. Uh, go for a little weekend, you know, learning thing. Come back and demonstrate a difference. You say, they go, wow, 
I love how you're doing that now. Well, you know where I picked that up? I picked that up at this thing that I read or that I went to or this webinar I watched. Um, and I, you know, I'm really committed to being the best I can be this year. I think you'll find that when you start showing the evidence of it, they're going to be a lot more willing to go, give me some more of that. Well, there is this conference I'd love to attend, or there is this program I think would be helpful. Uh, that's where you want to start but rather than going, I can't grow because my company won't let me. Don't ever let a partner or a company or a you know, relationship keep you from growing. It really is grow or die. Perfect. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head there, Darren. Thank you. Uh, let's see. So how Sarah Lee asks, how can you have a feeling of ownership when your company is compartmentalized and lacks transparency? Okay, so you just described 80% of companies that I encounter. <laughs> uh, and the way you do that is you change that. You become the one that is not being compartmentalized. Be a little bit of light in the midst of that compartmentalized darkness and don't play by those rules. So here's a simple one, We're talking about practical things. People talk about the IT department or the accounting department. Start talking about our IT department, our accounting department. Go outside the, the norm a little bit and talk to people and connect with people outside of those departments and say, hey, how can, how can the executives at this company uh, help you be more successful in your job? Find out some of that information. Look for ways to get, get outside of that yourself and be the trendsetter. Excellent. I love the switch of verbiage there and using our instead of they or them over there. It's us all together. Excellent. Okay. So let's see here. Um, for those that were asking about the eight fundamentals, I think the link was shared to those um, several times over. So I'm not going to, I'm going to skip over those ones. Let's see here. Um, where do you see the future of the um, the role of the assistant going? Where do you see the role of the assistant headed in the future, Darren, if you'd like to add some insight on that? So we can talk about that on a global scale. Uh, I think there's always going to be a need for people that are playing very vital roles in pulling together things and arranging things and making things happen. But let's talk about it on a very specific level, a very personal level. Where do you see your role going? And I'm looking at Joan right there on camera. Who and, and many of you may not aspire to this. You may love your role, and God bless you. I think it's a phenomenal role. I think it's a calling. I think it's more than just a job. But some of you may be, you know, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of Southwest Airlines. I met Herb Keller. Herb Keller started out with assistant. She ended up being a VP at the company. How? because she provided so much value over the time. So whether you aspire to that or not, create create personally your own role within there where you become indispensable. Perfect. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, this is an inter interesting question from Sunny. She says, when we're coming up with a plan and um, doing all of that work in the, in the forefront before we actually bring that idea to the executive or to the management team, um, could this be seen as a waste of time and doing all that work before the idea has actually gotten any kind of approval? Uh, it depends on where you put that. Great question from Sonny, because if you spend a lot of time on something that they're not interested in, then yes, it could look very self-serving. You know, I, I did all this research and came up with a plan why I should be promoted or why I should get a raise. Okay, That's not what I'm talking about. But when you come with something that is solving a problem for a company, they're so weighed down with people coming out of meetings going, you know, well, we should be doing such and so. And what they, mo most people do is they come take this big bomb and they dump it in the executive's lap for them to fix or take care of. And they come and say, hey, I've noticed this pattern and I've, I've done a little bit of research. Um, you know, if you're worried about that, do it in your own time. Do it in some other. And I think this is a better route for us to go. If it brings value, I, I believe that that's not going to be the, the, the problem you're going to run into. Great, thank you. Okay, now Lisa asked a question, and she works at a, at a university, a small university, and I think this question could be um, taken across the board for anybody that works in a small office, small business, um, maybe they're in a nonprofit and their their amount of employees are limited, and this is regarding your um, your fundamental on being a connector. So she says, the department at the university I work in is very small. Should I connect with other administrative assistants within the same college? 
And I'm thinking, what about other universities, other small businesses, and so on, if you want to add on to that, Darren? Oh, my. Okay, what was your name? Uh, Lisa. Lisa, I love you. That's awesome. Brilliant. Yes, it doesn't have, connecting doesn't have to be just within your company. It can be going to other administrators. Uh, it, it, you know, I think that's, it, uh, admins, I think that's part of the beauty of what the, like the conference does is you get to hobnob. How many of you go to something like that and you come away with a new idea? So that doesn't just have to happen at those gatherings. That can happen with the phone call, and I love where you're heading with that to uh, reach out to other people within the de you know other departments, but also other companies. Now, don't violate any trade se uh, trade secrets or you know <laughs> give stuff away to the competition, obviously. But yeah, I love that. Okay, perfect. Well, we have so many more questions, but I know we have an offer we want to share with our audience today, and then we'll see if, um, if there's any time after that to add any additional answers in there. So we have um, a very eager audience today, and I think that many of them have already run off and purchased your book, Darren. Awesome. <laughs> so I've seen the chat going. Wait, they don't, you don't even know about the special yet. <laughs> they just went nuts and went and shared the link and everything, So and they've kind of doing that. So um, next time we'll remember to tell everybody just to hold tight in the beginning of the webinar. I love um, it. Thank because, you. Yes, it's excellent. So for anybody who is on this webinar today um, who registers for our annual conference for administrative excellence, which is the revolutionary assistant this year, where we will be having Darren speak. Um, he will be presenting as one of our speakers at that conference. You will receive a copy of Darren's book, and that's just for people that are on the webinar that um, haven't registered yet, because everybody that's already registered, um, we couldn't possibly do that. We have 200 assistants already registered for the conference. So that um, you have had deals though and early bird specials and so on. So this is just for you today on the webinar and it will be available for 30 days. You will get a copy of Darren's book as well as the conference on demand included um, which is a, an add-on value of $99 but if you were to buy the conference on demand by itself it's $499. So you're going to get your conference on demand and you're going to get Darren's book, A Company of Owners, with your conference registration. So if you've been holding off, now is the time to register. We have a full agenda, 100% complete. We also have our gala event scheduled and we are taking everyone to see the Michael Jackson One Cirque du Soleil show right there within the same property. Um, so we are very excited to share that with you. If you Want to learn more about the conference? You can go to officedynamicsconference.com. Our webinar administrator is going to share the link to the registration of um, where you'll go to register for the event. So we are just really excited about that. But if you're not able to come to conference, which a lot of you shared during the event uh, or during the webinar today, that just conference isn't in the cards for you this year. Darren has a special offer he'd like to share with you. Oh, and before I hand it over to Darren, there is a coupon code for this offer, and that code is all capital D-A-R-E-N, Darren, with one R. So that is our code for today's offer, and I will email that to everyone um, within about 24 hours of the webinar so that I can share your certificate with you as well as this offer with you and Darren's offer that he's about to share with you. Darren, you want to go ahead and share that? So two offers. One, if you will compile some of the questions, I will sit down and put together some responses, and we can send that out to everybody if you'd like. So if their questions didn't get answered. Mm -hmm. The second is, uh, if you go to DarrenMartin.com, D-A-R-E-N-M-A-R-T-I-N.com, and hit shop, there's a bundle where you can actually get both books, Company of Owners. This one's whiteboard. It's a hand-drawn, handwritten, first of its kind. Uh, kind of funky book, uh, but I've got a special for y'all. You have to when you go to check out, enter the term, the uh, word dynamic, and you will get uh, both books for thirty dollars. So we will ship those to you. So that's a little extra special. I should have it, the code should have been Joan. Clearly now I'm feeling bad that I went with dynamic instead no, of that's Joan. That's great. <laughs> that's good. Dynamics. So you can also reach me through there. I, I, well, I'll just give my email to everybody. It's super easy, Darren at DarrenMartin.com. So if you had something that wasn't addressed, happy to give me a, give me a you know 48 hours, but I will get back to you as soon as I can. 
Excellent. And Darren, you just gave your email address to thousands of, of wonderful assistants who are going to be asking you um, all the questions on, on that ownership mentality, uh, which I think will be wonderful. So I just want to thank you, Darren, for taking the time. I know you're going to be with us in October, and that's going to be great. But just to take time out and meet our broader audience here um, at Office Dynamics and just these fabulous assistants all over the world. We've had people from Canada and Barcelona and, and just all, all over the, not just the U.S., but all over the world, interested and just hungry to learn and for you to take time out of your busy schedule. I know you're dialing in from a hotel room today because you're at an event and you're in between sessions, so thank you um, from the bottom of our hearts here at Office Dynamics and from all of the assistants for taking the time to do this today. Absolutely. Can't wait for October. It's going to rock. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be wonderful. Yes, thank you. I also want to uh, thank Darren very much for this time and wonderful insights. Um, I love it. Like I said, I've already read the entire book. It's an easy read, by the way, so there's no excuse to not read it. And also, I would just say if you did order a copy, um, to share it with your leader and your manager and mm. share it with your department. There are some great things in here that you could do you know, as a team. One thing I loved is Darren has ideas on how to incorporate more fun into your work. Mm. So assistance, as you get your departments together for monthly meetings or weekly meetings, you can pull some ideas from here we did to really incorporate fun which builds that team spirit and energy and you know just breaks up that the day the day to day mundane that makes us start to kind of feel like there's it's drudgery. So um, I want to encourage them to do that and, and spread spread this wonderful approach, you know, and philosophy in their workplace. So thank you, Darren, so much. Thank you. And I know it's gonna be fabulous in October and have a great day tomorrow with your teachings over there. <laughs> Thank you. I'm excited about uh, being with you guys again. So yeah. see you soon. It'll Thank get here you. quicker than we think. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.